Good evening and uh, welcome to Tamil Heritage Trust uh, Talk of the Month for November uh, 2023. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, a brief introduction to uh, Tamil Heritage Trust or THT as we refer to it. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, THT was set up as a not-for-profit in uh, uh, 2010 with the objectives of uh, understanding, appreciating, disseminating and celebrating uh, India's rich and varied heritage. Uh, towards this, uh, we have a number of uh, events and programs. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the main event that you were, you're all familiar with uh, is the monthly heritage talk, uh, which happens online uh, in English on the first Saturday of every month. We also have a monthly heritage talk uh, in person and hybrid uh, in, held in Chennai in person uh, in Tamil uh, on the third Saturdays of every month. Uh, apart from that, we have uh, more in-depth programs. One is called the Pechik Kacheri, which is coming up in December again, uh, which coincides with the uh, with Chennai's Kacheri season or the music season, where we talk of uh, we have a two-day program uh, with ten expert speakers speaking on a range of topics. Um, we also launched the Indology Festival a couple of years ago, and. Uh, uh, this is a one week long festival of talks on a specific topic uh, in depth. Uh, for instance, in uh, 2021, we had the Vijayanagara dynasty. Uh, last year, uh, we had uh, temple builders of medieval India. And this year in June, we had uh, India and the Sea, Sagara Sangamam in India and the Sea, where 14 speakers spoke on, uh, took us on a fascinating journey along India's long coastline to discover the influence of Indian trade across the oceans. All our programs are available for viewing on our YouTube channel. Uh, uh, those of you who are new to it, please go and check out that there are more than 200 odd uh, videos that you may want to peruse. Uh, and please do subscribe to the channel so that you will, you will receive notifications for future events as well. Uh, we conduct workshops. Uh, in Chennai, uh, the How to See a Temple workshop is a particularly popular one. In fact, the next edition is to be held tomorrow uh, here in Chennai. Uh, we also run a, a, a similar workshop for How to See a Museum uh, with the Chennai Museum here and a workshop on scripts like Pallav Granta, etc. Uh, we conduct a site seminar, uh, which is a slightly larger workshop which involves visiting monuments and sites of historical and heritage importance in the country uh, with a great degree of preparation by all the participants. Uh, we have a program for uh, 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 enabling teachers to take the word of heritage to, to their students through heritage clubs. It's called Alamaravai, and the second batch of teachers are being trained uh, 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 in, the current, in the current month. And soon we will have a, a new set of uh, heritage clubs across schools uh, in, in, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, we give away awards. Uh, one of them is the V. Venkaya uh, Epigraphy Award, which has been set up by the uh, family of uh, Sri V. Venkaya, who was the first Indian uh, head of epigraphy uh, in India. And this is to recognize, this is a unique award, almost a one of its kind award. It's there to recognize individual contributions in the area of epigraphy. Uh, we gave away this award in 2022 to Dr. Vaisu Brailu and 2023 to Dr. P. V. Krishnamurti. Uh, we also have the THT Professor Swaminathan Heritage Award, co-founder, uh, Professor Swaminathan. Uh, you can see him there giving away the awards to the winners over the last four years. And this year it was won uh, by Professor Devi Adivaselvam of Madurai recognize her exceptional individual contributions towards understanding and dissemination of uh, heritage. To join our mailing list, please write to admin at uh, tamilheritage.in so that you don't have to miss any of our programs uh, uh, that we conduct. Coming to today's program, we are extremely happy to welcome uh, Dr. V.N. Prabhakar of IIT Gandhinagar. Uh, we'd like to thank him, first of all, for so readily accepting our invitation uh, to deliver a talk for THT. And he's going to speak on the Harappan civilization and uh, 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 the emerging perspectives uh, thanks to several decades of research and field work that's been going on on these sites. 
Dr. Prabhakar is an is Associate Professor of Archaeology at the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Gandhinagar. Uh, he specializes in protohistoric archaeology of India, uh, archaeology, heritage management, and the application of sciences in, tech, in archaeology. Uh, he is also the Archaeological Sciences Center Coordinator at IIT Gandhinagar, uh, which fosters the application of sciences in archaeology. This is a new avatar for Dr. Prabhakar. He was earlier the Director of Exploration and Excavation at, at the Archaeological Survey of India, ASI, uh, in which role he coordinated the exploration and excavation activities throughout the country. Uh, he was subsequently the Director of the Institute of Archaeology, which is the academic wing of the ASI. In his role uh, in excavation, he's excavated the archaeological sites at Rupnagar and Paranpura, both of which are Harappan culture. Uh, he was also, I'm sorry, just. He was also responsible for the exploration and excavation, conservation, and preservation of 166 nationally essential heritage structures, including the world heritage sites of Ajanta and uh, Elora Caves. Uh, Dr. Prabhakar obtained his PhD from the Kurukshetra University, of India, uh, and he has published over 40 research articles in journals and has edited books and conference proceedings. Uh, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Prabhakar. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation and the uh, nice introduction. Uh, without wasting my time, and uh, I'll straight away share the presentation. I hope the screen is visible. Yes, it's visible. Yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, thank you once again uh, for the introduction and Tamil Heritage uh, Trust for inviting me to delivering this talk. Uh, today I will be talking something about. Uh, the entire knowledge what we have gained uh, throughout the hundred years of its uh, discovery and subsequent research carried out by various scholars, various uh, academicians in India, Pakistan, Oman, Afghanistan, West Asia. So we 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 are now in a better position. I mean, if we look back uh, hundred years back, we didn't know about uh, this culture. But exactly, I mean, I would like to uh, highlight the aspect that uh, exactly 100 years back, uh, on September 20th, 1924, the civilization was announced. The discovery of the civilization was announced. So we are in the 100th year, and it is, I think it is a befitting uh, occasion to speak something on Harappan civilization. So without, uh, uh, before, before, Starting that, I would like to acknowledge uh, a few personalities uh, who are really who have really contributed a lot in the field of Harappan archaeology. First and foremost, I would like to thank my guru, my mentor, uh, Professor R. S. Bisht, uh, who was the Joint Director General of ASA and is uh, guest professor at present in IIT Gandhinagar. I would like to thank my institution, IIT Gandhinagar, and also my parent institution, Archaeological Survey of India, where I learned a lot about Harappan civilization. Without my, uh, uh, what is a kind of postings in ASA, I would not have learned so much. I mean, I believe still I'm learning. I mean, I, it's still a learning experience for me, looking into various uh, works of various scholars, trying to uh, learn from them and enrich my knowledge. Sorry, I mean, there is a mistake here, India International Center, so sorry. So I, I would like to also thank uh, Professor Mark Kenoyer, uh, Randall Law and all the scholars, I mean, who have really contributed because it's this presentation, it's not only my work, but it, it includes results from various other scholars. So, as I told earlier, the story starts somewhere in on September 20th, 1924. Sir John Marshall, the Director General of Archaeology, after evaluating the findings from Harappa and Mohanjadaro, he understood with the aid of uh, Indian archaeologists like Dayaram Sani, uh, Adi Banerjee, uh, Kane Dixit, and so many senior archaeologists. So he understood that these excavations from Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, they belong to a single culture. It's not that they are uh, separated from each other, even though they are separated from each other by a geographical distance. So he understood the uniqueness of this culture, the similarity of this culture, so he announced, he announced in the Illustrated London News on September 20th, 1924. 
so it was a uh, it was widely circulating throughout the world and immediately in the next week itself uh, september 27 1924 professor a h sais who was working in west asia and he, who was also looking into the work of de morgan at susa an elamite site in in uh, iran southwestern iran so they realized that harappan seals they are found in a datable context in the west asian site and they date back to ni- uh, second mil- third millennium bce so immediately the chronology of harappan civilization uh, got a firm footing previously it was understood that uh, the indian history doesn't go uh, go back uh, the 6th century bce but there were several speculations when the civilization was discovered sir john marshall himself he proposed the chronology of uh, 3500 to 2500 to 1500 bce but ultimately these findings from a datable context from west asian site is gave a firm footing subsequently on october 14th uh, 1924 cj gad and sydney smith they published further more concrete evidence of harappan presence in west asia in a datable context so that's how the story begins and uh, if we look into our own state of affairs in 1947 when we got independence uh, and we got, uh, when two nations were born so all known sites they went to pakistan right only one site known site uh, that is rangpur it came into india so this was the picture in 1947 uh, everyone can understand uh, our own history dating back to third millennium bce and we didn't have any remains of that i mean at that particular point of time so subsequently a lot of field work was uh, done by various uh, institutions including the archaeological survey in it was the foremost institution which started the initial exploration starting in 1950s by a ghosh uh, who traced uh, the last saraswati river which is identified with the present day gagar akhra in india and pakistan and he discovered innumerable sites on its banks so that was the initial phase and subsequently lot of discoveries were being made one of the four, uh, one of the uh, stupendous discovery is that of mehergarh in the 1960s and later on when it was excavated by shah prasad jarej they brought to light a continuous history of the indian subcontinent uh, starting from around 8000 bce to around 2500 bce where uh, mehergarh's uh, history ends and immediately that was picked up by another nearby site known as uh, nausharo at uh, that uh, last to the entire harappan civilization and after that uh, iraq and sibri they continue uh, the uh, chronology up to the iron age and the early historical time so we have a continuous history starting from around uh, 8 millennium uh, uh, bce and uh, and we have a uh, lot of uh, uh, evidences from this uh, uh, site of mehergarh where we have evidences of an early food producing era i mean we all started uh, settling down around 12000 uh, years back uh, towards the end of the last ice age because certain climatic conditions induced the, the humans to settle down and uh, they were also started to domesticate plants and animals so that was a turning point in the entire human kind if you look into the entire uh, world's history that was the common uh, trajectory i mean if you look at the egyptian civilizations mesopotamian and also the shang civilization of china we all have this common trajectory of early food producing era that's what is marked here in the green color code so if you look into the green color code that is the earliest uh, earliest in all the civilizations you can see this green one that the chronology may vary chronology may go back in some civilizations it can start late in some some civilizations but the beginning point is the domestication of plant and animals a village based economy and agro pastoral style of economy which slowly and slowly uh, induced the humans to explore a lot i mean say they started to settle down they started to live in uh, houses slowly the population grew there was a continuous supply of food uh, previously they were hunter gatherers so they have to move from place to place now they have a continuous supply of uh, food which lasted throughout the year so there was uh, sufficient food for them so they could indulge in a lot of craft activities we see the emergence of craft activities long distance trade the mehergarh people they are communicating with distant cultures uh, uh from maybe 600 kilometers to 1500 kilometers to 2500 kilometers so they were communicating a lot 
and they were also procuring exotic raw materials these exotic raw materials they were uh, mainly meant for the elites it was not meant for common people so we start to see a, the emergence of a social organization right i mean if there is an equality among all the people so there was no necessity of uh, certain individuals possessing a, a quantity of wealth and other individuals they have lesser quantity of wealth so this we can observe from the burials if we look at the numerous burials starting from the neolithic age excavated from mehergarh we see the variability in the burial goods some burials they have enormous quantity of jewelry some they they have lesser quantity so this is a indication of the social hierarchy this is the indication of uh, uh, the uh, the quantum of wealth that is being possessed by the past humans so all these things is a clear indication of a social hierarchy that was emerging after the settling down of the human and slowly the population grew because of the continuous food supply the complexities grew the social organization also emerged so we gradually see the emergence of somebody controlling the population or in a, in in alternate terms we can say that a set of administrative rules are coming into existence so this is the threshold of uh, later period state level societies i mean if you look into the harappan civilization or the mesopotamian or the egyptian we call them state level societies because they have certain set of criteria that is being defined by scholars starting from 1950 onwards gordon child who put forth the first uh, set of uh, theories uh what is what he defined as a state level society from that time period onwards we have several scholars working on this and they have put forth uh, several criteria it is not necessary that all these criteria will be fulfilled in a particular state level society for example the harappan uh, civilization it did not fulfill the criteria of a standing army we didn't have a standing army so we didn't have palaces we didn't have the kind of aristocracy what we see in the mesopotamian and the egyptian civilization it we are a state level society because we were satisfying some other criteria so what we see is that the emergence of early food producing era somewhere around 8000 bc it continued for around 1500 years then we see the invention of copper the copper as a metal the smelting of copper intentional smelting it came around 5500 bc at mehergarh and maybe uh, simultaneously uh the the invention of the wheel wheel based the ceramic production and also the control of fire smelting of copper itself indicates that they control the fire they build certain kilns and furnaces to such an extent that they could heat uh, the the ceramics to up to uh, 1000 degrees also and also smelt copper so that they have now the control of fire that is known as the pyrotechnology so control of fire can be used for various other means also and they were also heating uh, some stones like steatite to increase its hardness for example soapstone it is it is uh, its hardness is uh, four in the most scale of hardness but it, when it is heated to 1100 degrees it it becomes white which was preferred by the mehergarh uh, people which was later also continued during the harappan times and the hardness increases to six so that is an enormous increase so that is an exponential increase so the all these things they were inventing maybe uh, maybe they were experimenting trial and error and ultimately they were inventing so many technologies which gave a firm footing for the later period emergence of the harappan civilization so what we see in the regionalization era is the emergence of several regional chalcolithic cultures with the technology of copper as well as the stone and also the ceramics distinct ceramics in diff- uh, distinct in different uh, regions like uh, northern gujarat known as the anartha culture it has a, di- a different uh, ceramic uh, tradition uh, southern sind we have the amri and the makran we have the miri khalat and shahitum type of uh, ceramic complex in the baluchistan upland we have the nal ceramics uh, also contemporary we have the faiz mohammed graver in the northern sind we have the kot dijian uh, ceramic complex in the rajasthan modern day rajasthan we have the toti siswal ceramic complex so all these ceramic traditions they existed simultaneously starting from maybe from around 4th millennium bce up to the middle of 3rd millennium bc so they were distinct pockets of uh, uh, cultures with the technology of copper and the stone and uh, they were living in uh, in an agro pastoral style of economy they were self sufficient and they were also exposed to certain raw material resources which were located nearby to the localities and they were exchanging gradually they they were starting to uh, exchange so that is the long, long distance trade so this long distance trade what happens is that uh, 
when the people of uh, dolavira observe that uh, the certain type of stones they are coming from northern pakistan and we have a lot of other regional cultures in between so the procuring them might have been very difficult so the regional chalcolithic cultures it existed for nearly 1500 years 2000 years and during the course of time they might have observed so many difficulties that led them to uh, take a decision very important decision that we should unite together i mean we are separated uh, uh, regionally uh, and our raw material resources are uh, spread all around the greater indus region and we are unable to uh, procure them and distribute them in an effective manner so why we should not unite right why we should not integrate uh, previously they were uh, they, they, many of them might have been integrated uh, uh, through ideological means and also religious means but but now they were also understanding the importance of a political uh, political not in the exact sense of a, a, a kingship sort of thing but a, a loosely arranged administrative setup where we can have common uh, uh, trade and also uh, exploit the raw materials in a better manner so that's how we see the integration era of the harappan civilization from 2500 or 2600 bc which lasted for nearly 700 years and during this 700 years they had a distinct uh, tradition I mean, all the previous ceramic traditions were discarded even though some many of them continued in in a very uh, rudimentary form or in a very subtle form but they have newer elements which were found in all the entire gamut of the harappan civilization some estimate the harappan civilization from 0.7 million square kilometers some estimate 1.5 million square kilometers but this entire civilization had a, had a distinct uh, ceramic tradition, weights and measures, seals and sealings, the writing system, the standardization of the uh, bricks, the ceramic styles, the paintings on the on the ceramic, the jewelry tradi traditions, shell shell uh, bangle, shell uh, uh, artifacts. So all these things put together, it forms the Harappan civilization or the Harappan culture. It's not that one element will represent the Harappan culture. It's all putting together. It is the assemblage that is put together. We call it as the Harappan civilization. And that lasted for nearly 700 years up to 19, 1900 BC. So after 1900 BC, what happened? It's really a, a complex uh, scenario. Uh, that uh, Recent studies with, uh, it, it, uh, it indicate that there was a long drought period starting from around... Uh, 2100 BCE. The Meghalayan event, what, what the paleoclimatologists and the archaeologists now describe, was a set of uh, a trigger points all over the world. It is not only in the South Asian context, it, it was also in the Egyptian civilization, the Mesopotamian civilization. There were certain climatic changes which happened and which triggered a series of uh, drought conditions uh, that could have been uh, lasted for five years, ten years, but Again, there could have been intermittent uh, rains in between. It was not a continuous drought, but it was a prolonged drought. There were uh, good phases also in between, but ultimately, the, it was forcing them to think in different terms. So along with that, uh, there could have been multiple other reasons uh, uh, towards the end of 1900 BC, where the, where the Harappan civilization it transformed into once more a rural culture from an urban uh, tradition. Maybe due to the uh, disappearance of the Saraswati River, because of tectonic movements, uh, uh, scholars, various scholars working on the uh, uh, geographical geog phenomena of Saraswati River, they estimate that the river Satluj it was joining uh, uh, Saraswati at one point of time, and they estimate that uh, before uh, eight thousand years before the Satluj left Saraswati and joined Bias, the present-day uh, course of Bias. But uh, what we what we see is that uh, uh, the the present day course of Satluj and Bayas combined to, uh, together it it uh, doesn't have any Harappan site. But if we look into the older course of Bayas, there are lots of uh, Harappan sites. So there there is some uh, some uh, uh, disagreement with the with the geological data as well as the cultural data, which can be called in the future. So, so to sum up. So from 1900 uh, BC onwards, we see uh, the transformation of the Harappan culture into a, into a rural culture, and what we call it as the late Harappan uh, uh, tradition that is represented by several regional cultures like the Jhukar culture in the Sindh, uh, Rangpur, uh, and the Lascaux Redwar culture in the Gujarat region, and the Bada culture in the 
punjab and western up so this is the long history and if you look into the uh, red portion which is highlighted here that is the urban phase again as i told you earlier the uh, the chronology varies in different culture and we see mesopotamia the urbanism started much much earlier and uh, at one point of time it was contemporary to the harappans the akkadians and the and the early dynastic third period they were contemporary to the harappan uh, civilization and they lasted up to the eastern latha dynasty of the mesopotamian time so th- this is the uh, nutshell of the uh, contribution of so many archaeologists working for the past several years so with this background we will proceed and explore much further so these are the evidences from mehergad what i was uh, referring into and uh, it was a village based economy initially to start with which later grew into a large uh, town based economy uh, the subsistence was based on the agro pastoral uh, uh, producers they had domesticated wheat and barley because we have evidence of uh, wild varieties of wheat and barley as well as uh, domesticated varieties of wheat and barley along with that we have various neolithic tools these are the polished uh, neolithic tools and uh, very good evidence of stone tools set on bitumen which were used as sickles to harvest the crops so they did have long distance trade 8000 bc as i mentioned earlier they were getting shell certain shell products from the uh, present day gulf of uh, kutch and the karachi coast that is around uh, uh, 600 kilometers also one type of uh, shell known as engina mendicaria you can show, uh, see the very beautiful striped shell from makran coast and madra pearl from oman that is 2500 kilometers away they were also getting lapis lazuli from afghanistan the badakhshan area and also turquoise from the central asian region so all this wealth of uh, exotic raw materials they are fashioned into jewelry and that is the beginning of craft activities as as i told earlier the the surplus in the food production enabled them to uh, kind of diversify into several craft activities which we see in the burials we see the jewelry the enormous jewelry which are taken along with them in the burial so individuals were buried with uh, ornaments which give the particular context also bracelets armlets uh, necklaces uh, and also hair ornaments and also the animals which were buried along with them we see the evidence of sheep and goats and those were the earlier animals which were domesticated docile animals which were used for uh, various mean for for meat products for leather products for mill and and various other uses so we see uh, this kind of pattern jewelry uh, animals buried along with that we see excellent uh, evidence of jewelry hair ornaments uh, we can see the minute uh, uh, steatite beads white in color i told you briefly about uh, how the steatite at- attains its white color because of heating up to 1100 degrees so these tiny beads were uh, uh, kind of uh, used this in her ornament and it is found in one of the burials and we also find certain emergence of certain ideological uh, ideas in this particular burial a lady she holds a triangular object uh, in in front of her face she holds the object in both her hands and it is placed in front of her face so this triangular terracotta object uh, slowly develops into beautiful uh, female figure in within the later times alcolithic time period so this is uh, this is how uh, the we can we can uh, definitely interpret uh, that this lady is holding uh, a female uh, figure in in her hands and it is buried along with her so it has certain uh, a significance we may not uh, know the exact uh, uh, meaning behind that but at least uh, we can surmise that uh, maybe that lady was intended to born again the people might have believed that uh, placing this uh, figure in in her hand and uh, placing it in front of her face uh, they might have believed that uh, she should again be born which which is which is very common among uh, many of the living uh, primitive societies i mean scholars working on the primitive societies observing their burial practices they have found that always they wanted uh, the dead ones to be reborn again so that that could be one of the uh, beliefs i mean uh, that could be one of the ideas so as i told you the regional chalcolithic cultures, cultures they had distinct uh, ceramic tradition some of the ceramic traditions they are shown here so one can very easily understand how distinct they are so they are a, they are found in a spatio temporal context spatio temporal context means uh, the uh, bottom right this anartha pottery it is found in a context of 4th millennium bc to early 3rd millennium bc in northern gujarat that's it it's not found in sindh it's not found in uh, rajasthan 
so that is a spatio temporal context and they were all uh, existing uh, uh, existing contemporaneously so we see different ceramic traditions spread across the entire uh, present day greater indus uh, region and they were all coexisting they all had a similar technology of uh, copper and lithics and also based on an agro pastoral community so from that we embark in around 2600 bc the integration of this regional chalcolithic cultures into the harappan culture and we see these distinct uh, uh, traditions i mean if you see the harappan uh, period remains they will have this kind of ceramics they will have the steel and ceiling certain jewelry layout of the cities and all those distinct patterns they start to emerge from 2600 bc and uh, this map i showed you earlier this was a scenario in 1947 but now we have this scenario right we know the settlement pattern in a better manner now when compared to the 1947 and now we understand a lot about the settlement pattern settlement hierarchy of the harappan civilization so looking into uh, this map uh, we will come to that later also i have marked some sites in a different color which are the urban uh, cities in the, in the modern sense you can say they are equivalent to the delhi bombay kolkata and chennai kind of uh, uh, cities uh, metropolitan city and uh, the the briefly i mentioned about the saraswati river and it's drying up around maybe 1900 bce so saraswati was flowing somewhere here parallel to the indus and it was draining into the run of kutch modern day run of kutch and satluj now which joins the bayas river it was joining the saraswati somewhere here so it was also contributing a lot for the saraswati river and uh, later on it uh, it uh, changed its direction and it flowed westward which is very beautifully recorded in the mahabharata uh, how the saraswati in satluj was shattered into 100 channels because of a certain curve so a geological event is also recorded in a literary event and that's how we can arrive at certain chronologies also so uh, we also see from the rigveda that uh, saraswati dried might have dried up around 1900 bc uh, because the early early vedic literature the rigveda it glorifies saraswati but the, from the later vedic literature onwards we we already notice that the saraswati river has, has disappeared and during the mahabharata times we have the very famous story of uh, balarama tracing the uh, retracing the course of river saraswati from its uh, sangam from its joining with the sea that is the run of kutch from there he he moves upstream and he sees the river at at certain pockets it disappears at certain areas it is only a slushy marsh and it uh, completely disappears that is known as vinashana he he mentions a place vinashana where the river completely disappears and he still moves further and ultimately a uh, sees the river flowing in in uh, haryana region maybe the kurukshetra region so this is how we understand uh, a, a geo- geological event uh, very beautifully uh, um, uh, recorded in several phases of the earliest uh, literary traditions of the india so modern geological st- studies has indicated uh, thanks to uh, several scholars uh, particularly professor rajesh sinha iit kanpur he concludes that saraswati dried up or uh, satluj shifted around 8000 uh, years back or saraswati might have uh, uh, started to dry up around 8000 years back but that does not coincide with the uh, with the emergence of harappan culture if we look into the harappan culture the site they are all located on the saraswati river and uh, if the river had dried up how they could have survived it's, uh, it's a very difficult question to answer so still lot of uh, uh, questions need to be answered but the remote sensing uh, uh, investigation they have helped a lot in locating uh, the dried up channel of the saraswati because there are a lot of uh, theories floated uh, by many historians and archaeologists uh, uh, about the mythical saraswati some say it is not at all uh, uh, true that the saraswati existed some say it is located outside india but if you look into the literary uh, archaeological geological and the remote sensing data we can definitely say a river flowed very parallel to uh, river indus it originated from the shivaliks uh, and it was once fed by river satluj also and many of the harappan sites are located on its channel and ultimately drained into the run of kutch so this is the this is the evidence what we get so this distribution map i showed earlier so we have uh, five larger cities or we can say six larger cities uh, Uh, they are harappa rakigadi ganvediwala lakhanjadodo mohanjadodo and dolavira 
So these cities are definitely of the uh, larger proportion. So Dolivera is the smallest uh, under hectare. Uh, Ganveriwala may be equivalent to that. And all the remaining four sites, they are mega, mega cities in, in a way. They are uh, 200 hectares and uh, in excess. So you, looking into the uh, settlement hierarchy, we can definitely uh, divide the settlements into cities, larger towns, smaller towns, villages, and hamlets with varying uh, area of occupation. We, ha we have a better chronology of the entire uh, uh, urban phase as well as the preceding uh, regional calculated cultures and the succeeding uh, uh, late Harappan phase. So we have a, a better chronology due to the ra uh, radiocarbon dating techniques which have really helped us a lot. So these are some of the uh, important uh, important cities and the sizes what are mentioned here and uh, the examples of uh, uh, regional towns, smaller towns, uh, very small size, villages and hamlets. And looking into the uh, location of the cities, they might have thought of something, I mean, administratively, because these cities are located uh, uh, at least 400, 500 kilometers from each other. Uh, that indicates something on why these should, cities should be uh, separated by 400, 500 kilometers. And they are located in different geographical zones of the Harappan civilization. So it clearly indicates that they could, they could be their regional centers of power. In other uh, sense, I mean, Professor Mark Kenoyer, he says they could be city-states in the in the sense of the Mesopotamian city-states before the Akkadian Empire came into existence. So there were regional centers of power which could have catered to a huge hinterland. Professor Mark Kenoyer estimates to 160,000 to 170,000 square kilometers of hinterland. Each uh, each major uh, city might have been uh, administrating in a, in a loose sense. But they were procuring the raw materials, redistributing them, managing various commercial activities, and also trading amongst themselves. So, looking into this scenario, we can have these kind of administrative setups. I mean, departing slightly from uh, Posel's uh, uh, provincial empires or provincial uh, regions, uh, uh, I have tried to visualize into more centers instead of four or five centers. There could be much more centers because we have. A larger city supported by uh, regional towns and smaller towns. So if we put all of them together, we see a, a, a kind of pattern emerging uh, due to due to which these uh, the cities and towns might have administered in a, in a better manner to to communicate with uh, between each other and also to procure and redistribute the raw material. So among these uh, Harappan sites, we have two of them inscribed in the World Heritage List. Uh, one is one is Mohanjodaro that dates back to 1980. During the initial phase itself, it was uh, inscribed in the World Heritage List, followed by Dolavira, which was inscribed very recently in 2021. So, coming to uh, how the urbanism came into being, right? I told briefly about certain criteria put forth by scholars for the emergence of state level societies. So, uh, Mark Kenoyer, he uh, proposes these four criteria for the Harappan civilization. One is the subsistence economy, that is diversification. It means if they were not dependent upon only the summer crop or the winter crops. They were having options of both summer and winter crops, which was also based on agro-pastoral lifestyle. They had both urban and rural ways of lifestyle and also producing a surplus. The surplus in food production was the very basic uh, necessity for the emergence of a state level society. So we see very good evidence in the Harappan uh, civilization. The second is the socio, social and economic trade network. I mean, where the raw materials, it is a very skewed distribution. If you look into the copper resources, it is located in the northern Aravallis and southern Aravallis. Beyond that, there is no copper. Otherwise, one has to go to Balochistan or Oman. So how this can be procured and uh, uh, redistributed in a proper manner. So this, this social and economic trade network was uh, very essential and uh, that led to the better management of resources. Uh, some of the examples are agate carnelian from Gujarat reaching Harappa and stated from Azara deposits of northern Pakistan reaching Dolavira. The third one is complex technologies. We see emergence of very different uh, complex technology. One, one example is this kind of stoneware bangle uh, technology, which originated during the Harappan culture and disappeared along with them. I mean, we, could, we are unable to even reproduce them with the modern uh, technology also. So how these technology could have catered to certain elite. So this kind of technology 
similarly agate carnelian jewelry these kind of jewelry they were produced only during the harappan time before and after we don't see this, this kind of uh, jewelry and also differential social hierarchy so this social hierarchy i briefly touched upon during the mehergarh phase so that was very much essential this uh, the the headman or the clan leader or the tribal leader in a way they could also prevent others from uh, getting access to certain important raw material resources so this kind of hierarchy ultimately led to the development of uh, an administrative system also and also the controlling the distribution network so we, for this we see evidences in the differential units of habitation we see clusters of uh, uh, habitation in the harappan cities what we call sometimes as citadel and lower town but we have clusters many different clusters uh, harappa at least six cluster of different uh, areas of occupation mohenjodaro at least two but it there could be more dolavera we have four and hierarchy in burials i briefly touched upon how the differential uh, interment of wealth in the burials can indicate the social hierarchy and various other uh, means and methods we understand so these are some of the examples how they had a winter as well as a summer uh, cropping pattern so the harappans what we see is that they had wheat barley rice and millet uh, more or less catering to the rabi and curry pattern of the modern day time period they also produced legumes uh, matar masoor chana moong udad so various i mean it, it's not only one particular type of crop they were producing more more varieties so that was helping a lot similarly if we look into the animal uh, base i mean apart from cattle uh, sheep and goat we have evidence of various other animals which they could have been uh, access to and they could have been uh, uh, used them in the daily life for example dog we we do have uh, evidence of elephant uh, bones also rhinoceros bones also even camel bones so all these things clearly indicate uh, a wide variety of network uh, and that's how they were they could uh, they could uh, integrate uh, the important uh, regions in such a manner that they could gain access to important raw materials this we understand better due to the seminal work of randall law who who has dedicated his uh, phd uh, thesis for understanding the raw material procurement network of uh, harappa and slowly we also understand how different raw materials they could reach uh, uh, many distant uh, regions one example is the grinding stone i mean uh, randall law attaches more importance to the grinding stone because if you are unable to grind uh, your cereals wheat and barley you can't produce bread right you can't eat so in order to produce uh, uh, flour and if you want to have a good diet without any kind of inclusions because if you have a softer rock to grind your cereals then you are also getting all the gritty materials which will be harm your teeth and also it will go into your uh, stomach and it it will, it, it will okay, kind of cause harm so the harappans they were looking in, looking for very harder stones quartzite was preferred certain varieties of sandstone like pub sandstone coming from western pakistan and also from the gagar river bed they were preferring this particular uh, kalyana delhi quartzite which was uh, which is available from a, from a hill of near uh, delhi from a locality known as kalyana it is found everywhere in the harap in the harappan period of punjab and haryana if you go to any side be it rakhi gadi mitatal karanpura kalibungan banavali uh, any other site you will find this typical quartzite which is very hard even today the village produces grinding stone so that is the beauty of this uh, stone right so it is distinguished by this very thin line of blackish line and immediately one can say this is from kalyana so this is the location of kalyana from where it produced it supplied a large number of harappan sites and ultimately it was reaching harappa i mean that is the beauty i mean harappan they were procuring grinding stones from far away distance 400 500 kilometers what was the necessity for that so they need to have very hard grinding materials for their uh, production of uh, a flour of the cereal so another another stone is this kind of gray sandstone which is also equally hard which comes from the foothills of the shivaliks and they were also procured uh, by this uh, by this uh, cultures at uh, uh, karanpura so the second criteria is the social and economic uh, trade networks i mean what we uh, what we saw is that i mean how they were controlling the different uh, 
uh, economic networks. So the one particular evidence was given in the case of uh, agate carnelian resources. So agate carnelian it is found only in the in, a, in the Gujarat region. This is the Ratanpur Rajpipla mines, uh, and these are the Kandi uh, Kandi area and the Mardak bed. So analysis again by Randall Law it clearly indicates that uh, these stones were uh, procured from Gujarat and ultimately supplied to the uh, Harappan sites of Chandogarh, Mohenjo-daro, maybe Harappa. Another very important uh, resource material is the copper. So we do have copper near the Ambaji uh, Sendra belt, uh, which is the southern Al Aravalli region in Rajasthan, where this copper was mined even very recently by the Gujarat uh, government, and later it was abandoned because uh, the, the percentage of copper it went down very, uh, very much. So. These abandoned mines, uh, uh, we can still see the presence of uh, green color uh, stones which have traces of copper. And from here, they, the Dolavira Harappans got the copper. And uh, the uh, coming to the third criteria, which is the complex technology, uh, one of the complex technologies is the production of this kind of uh, uh, pillar bases and pillar elements which cater to only the elites. I mean, these pillar elements, they are found only in the in the gates of Dolavira, you can see one of the uh, pillar elements kept in my background that is from the east gate of Dolavira. And uh, the, this, this kind of pillar base, uh, pillar elements, they were produced from a site uh, three kilometers northeast of Dolavira. And they were uh, uh, they were then transported to the site of Dolavira. There they were polished and smoothened uh, to extraordinary fineness. And later on, they were fitted in as uh, architectural elements in the gateway. So many of them, they were also transported to Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. I mean, imagine Dolavira is on an island in the run of pets. From this island in the run of pets, they were transporting these uh, huge pillar elements weighing nearly 200-300 kilograms to Mohenjo-daro and then to Harappa. So understanding th uh, this kind of uh, complex transportation is also very, uh, very much uh, uh, awe-inspiring. So another technology, what we see in the case of Dolavira is the uh, is the uh, these kind of uh, tanks and uh, reservoirs, what they produce. I mean, some of the reservoirs, they are rock cut. We can see here the southern series of reservoirs that uh, Dolavira it was completely rock cut and they were uh, they were diverting the water from the nearby stream and they were storing it. Uh, and this is another reservoir which is uh, much, much larger. I would say this is the largest uh, reservoir in the, in the Harappan uh, time period. And it also had a step well. This is the earliest step well. Uh, they dug into the into the bedrock that, uh, that when the water level was reached after excavation, it still produced some sweet water. So the Harappans they had enormous uh, understanding of uh, of uh, the the catering to the climatic conditions and also uh, harnessing the rainwater. So one more uh, complex technology I told about the bead drilling technology. The Harappans they had a particular stone known as urnustite. I mean. We are unable to know its geological provenance, whether it is natural or man-made, we don't know. There are several views on this, but it, this mineral, this uh, this stone, it has uh, titanium oxide phases and also silimanite and mullite phases, which clearly indicate that it was heated to very high temperatures, uh, maybe around 1200 degrees centigrade, and the titanium oxide phases, it gives a, a very hard uh, surface, which was helpful in in perforating the uh, stone beads and they could produce these kind of uh, jewelry. Uh, this is the decorated cornelian bead, which is also known as the uh, edge cornelian bead. These are the long barrel uh, uh, beads which were used for making this kind of waist bands. And we get uh, the evidence from these terracotta figures. You can see the waist bands uh, here, and this is only meant for the ladies. And these two were traded extensively to the Mesopotamian region. And these are the earnest uh, drill bits which I documented from the site of Dolavira. We have uh, an enormous quantity of uh, drill bits when compared to other sites, which can clearly indicate that Dolaviran's uh, might have been uh, uh, able to uh, gain access to this particular kind of raw material in a better manner when compared to other other places. So when comparing uh, Dolavira and Harappa, at Dolavira we have 1586 uh, uh, drill bits. Whereas at uh, Harappa, it is uh, around only around 65. So we also looked into the surface modification of this drill bit, how uh, they might have been used for perforations and how the perforations induce certain surface modifications uh, also. So in comparison to the modern bead making uh, tradition at Khambat, they, were, they, they are still using the same kind of mechanism by chipping 
this kind of chipping with a with a technique known as the inverted direct uh, indirect percussion uh, technique where they they uh, they chip the stones initially to produce a rough shape then they polish it uh, with a emery wheel which was not in the case of the harappan they have to uh, polish the beads for nearly 45 days uh, putting them inside a leather leather uh, bag and rolling it uh, for 45 days they 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 were also heating the agate carnelian to to remove remove the humidity to remove the water content and also to achieve the typical reddish color so this modern uh, bead making industry at kambat it gives certain insights uh, but it is also a dying tradition so this uh, some of the raw materials they were procured in gujarat and they were ultimately traded i mean one for this one excellent evidence uh, uh, it was pointed by professor mark nayar this kind of uh, banded agate from dolavi right has its exact similarity at harappa not only that a, a bead was produced out, out of this uh, uh, banded agate and the bead was found in a burial and the raw material was found in a bead workshop in the habitation area so this is a wonderful evidence from where we can understand the trade network and how it was uh, traded from one place to another so another very good example is the stone uh, bangle stone ware bangle because uh, that even though it is made of clay it was uh, prepared in such a complex technology and heated to very high temperatures uh, that the clay slightly vitrifies and becomes resembles a stone so these these bangles they are found in very uh, limited number in the in the in the harappan context and uh, it is only restricted to harappa mohenjodaro and uh, very recently now we have found in uh, dolavira also and also the ideological transmissions and also the the kind of jewelry what the harappans they were wearing so one one particular incident is this uh, so called priest king where he wears a uh, one kind of a fillet with a with a i bead here so very similar to that they have found for some mark and have found the i bead from uh, uh, from harappa and this kind of fillet they are already known from dolavira we have a copy of this instead of a golden i bead they have produced a copper i bead but they could have finished the copper in such a manner that it could have resembled gold and it was inlaid with a stated which is white in color so it could have produced a very beautiful uh, appearance uh, we do have excellent evidence of architecture uh, uh, we do have uh, the well laid out uh, cities and towns uh, and dolavira in particular it has a uh, a a very good a very good layout with uh, with uh, ratios and uh, proportions so this is how each and every uh, part of the city it has uh, a very well laid out uh, ratio and uh, proportion and they had a very very elaborate arrangement of hierarchical uh, uh, arrangement of these individual units uh, if we take into the castle of uh, dolavira it has an elaborate security arrangement it cannot be reached very easily so when i when i uh, try to uh, understand the layout in terms of uh, various checkpoints so i could notice at least five checkpoints before one reaches the castle through the north gate and three checkpoints before one reaches the city through the east gate so such is the elaborate arrangement and excellent preserved architecture uh, uh, evidence from dolavira it gives an idea about uh, the architecture during the harappan period uh they were using uh, bricks in a, in a large manner one is to two is to four is the brick ratio the sizes of the brick varied from 7 14 28 to 8 16 32 to 9 36 uh, uh 9 uh, 18 36 to 10 uh, 20 and 40 the 10 20 40 uh, brick sizes they were used for fortification and the houses they normally employed 8 16 and uh, 32 this is the kind of ceramic tradition what we see a distinct red color ceramic both painted and unpainted with black colored uh, 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 paintings and also we have evidence for uh, transportation i mean from the uh, from the chariot uh, single person driven chariot uh, uh, drawn by the uh, bulls uh, to complete uh, carriage vehicles and also boats and ships so this this kind of evidence clearly indicate that uh, they were trading a lot uh, they are using the road network and the Uh, river and the and the sea network a lot so the trade network is supplemented by the use of uh, seals and sailings they were basically recording uh, the, the the maybe the guild or the person who is trading and it normally had the unicorn and the harappan script at the top with a manger in the in the front we do find a uh, circular seals they are very few in number but they they come in a later period context of 2200 bc onwards and it seems that bahrain uh, was the main area from where 
the settled harappans or the harappans trading with the bahrain region might have been uh, uh, the reason for behind for producing these kind of uh, uh, circular seals because these seals they have the typical harappan uh, buffalo water buffalo with the harappan script but it is only uh, it is circular in shape so that is the only change and uh, the 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 weights and measures from uh, various sites it clearly indicates uh, a well uh, well proportioned and standardized the weighing pattern which progresses in the uh, binary system and uh, the weighing pattern it could have emerged from various uh, grain weights and the very close with the gunja seeds uh, uh, which uh, which uh, varies from uh, 0.109 to 0.113 grams and eight such grains it is the first weight ratio of the harappan system of kemi so we what we see is a very close connection between the grain weights and the uh, harappan weights even though we have seen even smaller weights in the case of dolavera dolavera the smallest weight is around 0.5 gram and the largest weight is around 13.67 kilograms so we have a we have a very good weighing system which clearly caters to the uh, uh, trading of uh, a very precious uh, element, uh, object like gold to so maybe they were weighing also grain so the copper metallurgy is one another important aspect uh, and we do find a very a series of uh, objects starting from arrowheads to needles to uh, to pins to coal stakes to uh, weighing pans to vessels to uh, to mirrors is also we have a wide variety wide variety of um, the copper objects very interestingly from a site known as bagasra in gujarat they had a razor i mean razor used to shave right uh, shave the uh, shave the beard uh, for the for the men folk uh, and that uh, razor it was set in a rib rib bone of a cattle so they were picking up the rib rib of a cattle and they were fitting the very fine razor into the cattle and this and the shape of the razor also resembles a modern day one i mean one can one can really wonder how the 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 shape also travels a lot uh, in in course of time so scientific analysis uh, of uh, the copper objects lead silver through a technique known as the lead isotope analysis also helps in pinpointing the provenance of this uh, uh, of this metal so randall law who did this analysis uh, uh tries to find out from various regions and in, in particular for gujarat the copper came from the ambaji chandra belt so they did have exquisite jewelry in gold you can see these uh, exquisite jewelry in gold and shell objects they produced enormous quantities of shell bangles uh, bagasra again it yielded a complete shell bangles stacked in one place uh, having 2000 uh, bangles at one place and they were also producing this kind of inlays they might have been stitched on cloth producing very beautiful pattern imagine a dark colored cloth of a red or a blue or a black in color background and these kind of white colored inlays are fit in to produce various kind of geometrical motifs they were also producing this kind of grooved bangles smaller shell bowls ladles for various purposes so we do find a various uh, objects in in different forms and shapes they did also invent one particular technology known as the faience technology faience is nothing but early form of glass it was produced by crushing the quartz and also adding coloring agents and a flux and they can uh, they can get a material which can be molded into many different forms initially it might have been uh, used for resembling some of the stones which are very hard to procure for example turquoise one of the very earlier uh, color uh, for faience is this bluish uh, uh, green color Uh, which which resembles the turquoise which is an exotic material they could not find it very easily so they resemble they 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 fake turquoise in a in a ceramic material and slowly they improved the technology to such an extent that they started to produce two different types of uh, faience one is compact faience faience and one is a, a coarse variety of faience and they were used for producing different kind of uh, objects so this object is very interesting i mean if you look at this this object this is a very small jar hardly 1 inch in height 1 inch or 1 and 1/2 inch in height actually this is the coal jar i mean for applying the surma uh for applying the tanmai i mean they were using galena uh, which is the naturally occurring uh, uh, lead raw material which was used as a surma and this was also found that this is the kind of stone or bangles which are produced in a very few in number and that the kind of importance attached to the stone ware bangles is indicated by the 
inscriptions maybe the owner he or she they inscribed on this uh, stone where bangles to indicate their ownership because of its rare rarity and also uh, very complex technology so we do find uh, uh, various burial practices but this one is very unique uh, this is a burial mound uh, closely resembling the royal burials of uh, bahrain of the dilmun culture uh, at, at dolavira we don't have any skeletal remains so this is one of the tumulus burials at dolavira resembling the royal burials of bahrain so at this time period we do find uh, contacts with the uh, with the mesopotamian region as well as the bahrain region from gujarat and maybe certain influences might have occurred i mean we don't have any different conclusions but we do find uh, this kind of evidence similarly we have various other burials very closely uh, uh, resembling are the other harappan times from other regions but here there are no skeletal remains but at other harappan sites we do have skeletal remains and one of the very important uh, studies uh, in which i was also formed uh, part uh, is the stable isotope analysis of these skeletal remains i mean we can uh, analyze the tooth uh, tooth of these uh, humans uh, from the burial and analyzing the molar the first and second and the third molar we can understand whether these people came from a particular region or not so in this in this kind of analysis lead and strontium are, are analyzed Uh, lead and strontium come from the geological uh, uh, earth and it is unique to every different part for example uh, lower indus middle indus and upper indus they have different uh, lead and the strontium concentrations so the people residing in those region when they consume the plant and the animal products uh, the very minute traces of lead and strontium it is also uh, it is also uh, deposited in the in the tooth remain for example when the when a young person who is stay, staying in the lower sin region he had a diet uh, of that particular region that is uh, implanted in his uh, tooth enamel when he when he moves to upper sin re, upper uh, indus region and he starts to consume a different diet then the then the next uh, molar or the other teeth which erupt later on so it will have a different uh, signature so based on these uh, uh, concentrations of lead and strontium one can understand whether these people move from one place to another or not so we did the this analysis for uh, sanoli and uh, we found out that most of them most of the people they are from local and from sanoli we do find enormous uh, evidence of the fayans industry because the fayans it was initially for replacing the stone raw, exotic raw materials when the harappan culture came to an uh, end uh, that it transformed into a rural culture the trade network snapped and they could not procure the uh, very good fine quality stones from gujarat so they started to produce uh, fayans in a larger quantity and they started to replicate each and every every stone for example i have i have compared the uh, sanoli evidences of fayans uh, with that of the naturally occurring stones and how beautifully they were uh, imitating the stone uh, material so this is the analysis from uh, sanoli uh, this, this is the uh, sanoli individuals some individuals they are from outside but definitely most of them they are from the sanoli region so one of the enigmatic aspect of the harappan civilization is the harappan script which is yet to be deciphered uh, uh, it belongs to a category of uh, a script known as the logo syllabic uh, script it is it is not a it is not an alphabetic form of script it is not a syllabic form of script but a logo syllabic form of script so in simpler sense one sign in the harappan uh, script can can mean a complete word or a single phonetic value so this is the complexity i mean we cannot guess here we cannot guess we cannot substitute phonetic values as it was done in the case of other unknown scripts and we don't have a bilingual or a trilingual uh, inscription so that is another very important uh, criteria for deciphering an unknown script egyptian and cuneiform uh, it had a bilingual script and we don't have lengthy inscription so that was that is another criteria uh, when the linear b script was deciphered it was also uh, it didn't have the bilingual or trilingual script but doing a structural analysis they could understand the structure but they had a longer inscription the unfortunately harappan uh, inscription the longer inscription it is from the of uh, uh, 16 sign so it is it is very complex so the harappan script cannot be deciphered uh, in the absence of uh, uh, in the, in the absence of uh, bilingual or trilingual script in the absence of a lengthy inscription it cannot be deciphered but what it is what it was written there that one can understand i mean the 
there is a consensus among the scholars that the, the numerical vertical strokes uh, they mentioned the numerical signs uh, and uh, and because of the trade between the harappans and the mesopotamians ultimately what we have to search uh, the about a bilingual or a trilingual inscription it's not in the harappan region but in the mesopotamian region because we do find a lot of evidence of the harappans staying there and if you look into the cuneiform inscriptions they mentioned about the three regions uh, uh which they were uh, through which uh, they were trading one is the dilman dilman is bahrain and its adjoining region magan is the oman peninsula and meluha is uh, is the harappan civilization so we do have evidence of different products coming from this region and uh, some of the geographical evidence are also clearly indicating so we have these uh, material remains from west asia particularly from sites in uh, kishwar lagash uh, nippur mari susa lot of sites have yielded uh, harappan materials i mean we do, we do find uh, them and uh, a, a compilation by fossil uh, it clearly indicates what kind of materials were exported by the harappans they were exporting carnelian the all the reddish ones are carnelian lapis lazuli the bluish color from La uh, from afghanistan pearl then they were also exporting woods and plants i mean one type of uh, wood is gizabba meluha mesu wood mesu wood some scholars have pointed that it could be the shisham wood fresh dates then animals various kind of animals they were uh, being uh, viewed by the mesopotamians were very distinct from their own ones then metals copper and gold meluhan style objects i mean even though they might not have been exported but they were very unique i mean for example the ships of meluhan type they, they were all constructed of timber the mesopotamian ones they were all constructed of reed because they didn't have any timber it's a it's a huge alluvial alluvial plain no forests no trees so they might not have seen a ship constructed of timber so it was very unique for them so meluhan type furniture the furniture used by the harappan they, it was uh, different so figurines of meluhan boards so all these things were known from the uniform inscription so if we plot So some of the very important jewelry of the Harappan uh, culture, particularly the long barrel cylindrical beads and the decorated cornelian beads, you can see the extent of the Harappan trade. To some regions, they might have traded uh, directly, like the Mesopotamians, Bahrain, um, Dilman, and the Magan. But other regions like Turkey, even Troy, or even up to Greece, or even Abydos in uh, Egypt, they did not. They might not have traded directly, and these objects could have reached there through indirect. Uh, trade so one particular aspect about this trade is this indus type seals which are circular in shape i told you uh, earlier they come from very uh, limited context but interestingly uh, these uh, these could be personal names and this could be also uh, some very important uh, uh, indications like they could be patronymic because man and twin sign these are always having a, a man a twin twin man actually i mean uh, you, you can see how they are depicted always they are Uh, depicted along with two signs so uh, from many different contexts even the dole vera circular seal also has twin man so this this again indicate uh, uh, some uh, some indications of uh, the patronymic nature and also it could be uh, uh, the, the a different language style maybe because this kind of pattern it is not tallying with the arapan language uh, style or the uh, the structural analysis what it has been then so there could be uh, different patterns also harappan and non patterns so that's why uh, the evidences from mesopotamia is very uh, important to understand uh, not only studying from the harappan region uh, is important it, we have to uh, study the patterns from the mesopotamian uh, region also so that is one evidence and uh, finally uh, these are some some seals which have been uh, uh, pointed to several scholars like uh, marcano er massimo vidali uh, denis prenes how a typical harappan seal is a square shape it's a typical harappan seal because other cultures they didn't have this kind of uh, seal it is a water buffalo which is again a harappan motif uh, uh, with, with a clear uh, uh, feeding uh, thing in the in front uh, which closely resembles the harappan type and a cuneiform script this is very unique this is not a harappan script all other things are harappan but only the script is cuneiform so when it is deciphered so it's not giving any history it is not giving any dynastic list it is not giving any other historical information it is only pointing out to the uh, name of a person or uh, some some message i mean like here the kaku is favorable or the affair be favorable that's it i mean nothing beyond that i mean people are attaching lot of uh, 
meanings a lot of uh, funny interpretations uh, they don't understand the context here i mean they have to take note of this kind of scenes which comes from mesopotamia uh, maybe they, this is a product of a harappan settled in mesopotamia after three or four generations they were completely acculturized and they were starting using the local language but yet they did not uh, uh, forget about their roots so there are other scenes also again again they clearly indicate uh, some deity's name the person's name and not of any historical or any any other information so we do find the evidence of cuneiform records from uh, lagash uh, which clearly indicate the presence of harappan one particular record it it record uh, that a man named ul ur lama son of meluha means a harappan he he owes 41 pounds of wool the balance of two talents 50 pounds of wool which he had previously brought, borrowed you see this is a very clear indicator of person living in that particular city who he has borrowed and he had to return it back right so this is clearly recorded so another record it says a man of meluha pays 10 shekels of silver to a servant as compensation for a broken broken teeth so somehow uh, due to some dispute he might have broken the teeth of his servant but yet he had to pay compensation of 10 shekels so this is a clear indication of the harappan settling there and we do find uh, this type of seals very close to resemblance resemblance with the harappan type but an unknown script again this is coming from uh, a different region this is from the oman region or from a site known as salur so one can clearly see a pattern here this kind of uh, water buffalo with uh, with an offering with uh, with a feeding uh, uh, cup in front uh, and the inscription square shape seal which is harappan completely harappan but the inscriptions they are all local they are all uh, uh, due to the harappan settling down maybe two or three generations they completely lost or they completely uh, could not uh, uh, understand their script itself or they they have to uh, communicate uh, with the locals they are producing this kind of seal for local consumption so ultimately what the climate says i mean i briefly mentioned about the 4.2 Uh, K event and uh, that that uh, tallies very well with various regions like uh, this is from the Maumlu K from northeastern uh, India, but, uh, then Arabian Sea Core, Gulf of Oman. All of them clearly indicate uh, a a climatic change. But uh, again, the Kotla Dahar evidence uh, it's a regional phenomenon. I mean, we do have many different regions in the Harappan uh, domain, and they also cater to different climatic uh, conditions. For example, Gujarat. it has a different climatic condition it has a semi arid environment so the the cropping pattern might have been different so we need more and more climatic data from different regions to have a consensus so what the present uh, uh, scenario indicate is that the 4.2k event might have triggered events but slowly it could have transformed the monsoon regimes but uh, we don't have any evidence of sudden death or sudden decline so that that uh, we can say i mean at least we can say that uh, the, uh, the 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 decline might have been very slow and steady but not a sudden one so this is the uh, post harappan scenario or the late harappan scenario which i mentioned uh, uh, briefly earlier also where we have regional cultures again so with this uh, with this background what we have to do i mean we are in the 100th year and at many different aspects many different threads they are still unknown so what we have to do in the future what uh, steps can we take i mean we don't know, we, we don't have any idea about polity and organizational setup so we need to understand more uh, about this so we do, we have to do more hinterland uh, surveys we have to understand the relationship between bigger and the smaller sites and also we need to understand uh, about the sites from the raw material or areas how they were actually producing so that that we need to understand so for the harappan script i have uh, uh, mentioned earlier so we need to uh, Uh, update the concordance of our harappan script and also the corpus of indus script and inscription and we need to also have more research about the harappan from the cuneiform records from the west asia so that is very much uh, essential so we need to understand also the mobility paleo date and paleo climate uh, for that we need to have extensive residue and soil analysis lake profiles we need to understand the paleo lakes understand the past climate we need to understand more about the other technologies because even today we cannot uh, reproduce the stone wall bangle uh, technology and we need to also create an awareness because there's a lack of awareness uh, and that's why there's a threat of uh, a threat to many archaeological sites so we need to educate uh, 
the younger minds we need to tap them from the very early uh, part of their life maybe from the school we should start and try to educate them about the health uh, culture and their importance and ultimately we need to have online databases so one of the best databases is harappa.com where we find excellent uh, uh, database of the entire harappan civilization videos uh, articles and many different materials are uh, displayed there so we need to have more and more uh, uh such uh, uh such things and we also need to do more about the stable isotope analysis which is a very clear indication of movement of people uh, based on many different uh, isotopes uh, isotopes and also a uh, scientific data has to be compared with the archaeological uh, evidences and finally we need to have very good remote sensing data a lot of techniques are available even today to understand uh, the shifting and drying up of uh, various uh, rivers so there are various issues i mean if we look into the uh, picture what we had 100 years before and now we have progressed a lot but it we need to cover a vast distance uh, many different areas need to be covered and uh, for the science alone can help uh, along with the cultural uh, anthropologists and the archaeologists linguists if they all can come together we can have still more information about the harappan thank you thank you very much i think i took a lot of time uh, thank you very much uh, for listening patiently if you have a, any questions i am too like, eager to answer uh yes uh, yes we have uh, quite a few questions uh, do you want to keep the uh, the presentation on or you want to close the presentation so that we can i i i can close it I can. yeah okay um so let, let you know what i would like to do is uh, uh you know we will uh, we'll start by uh, discussing uh, you know some uh, some questions that uh, uh you know generally people have been uh, uh, having not asked here but uh, we do have uh, some uh, questions overall and then i will take up some of the specific questions uh, that people uh, have asked in the channel so one of the uh, things which is you know partly controversial is that uh, uh, the river saraswati now i don't want to completely go into controversies but i wanted to start with this question because there are two or three follow up questions as well on this so from what i could understand uh, some people say there is no such river no river uh, uh, at all the other is there could have been a river but it is not called saraswati because there is that whatever you call a saraswati is haraihwati which is you know uh, far uh, west of uh, the current indus right um and you are infusing uh you know rigveda and uh, other connotations and so there is a there is an existing controversy right now in this connection there is one question that uh, uh bharat raj has asked if the avastan akaminid reference to hind is taken as reference to sindhu then the akaminid reference to harahati in afghanistan should be taken as saraswati why is there a con- inconsistency so i want your opinion on this and then we'll go to other issues actually this kind of uh, uh, anomalies have been uh, propagated by a set of historians i mean if you look into the 19th century research articles by old hams there is there are two old hams mm-hmm. right 18 1870s and 1890s so at the time nobody i mean uh, created these kind of controversies they clearly identified uh, a river flowing uh, east of indus which was also fed by satluj and they identified it saraswati if you if you look into the maps of 1860s and 1870s uh, onwards so you see saraswati clearly marked in modern day haryana right so this is this is one evidence i mean why it cannot be a harakwati of uh, Uh, afghanistan I mean, rigveda clearly says that the uh, the river originated from the himalayas and uh, and drained into the sea right so where in afghanistan you find a sea and uh, where uh, it, it drains i don't know so no, definitely it is not in uh, afghanistan and the nadi sukta of uh, rigveda 10th mandala it clearly mentions about uh, uh, certain rivers 
in in a in a geographical uh, position it it mentions about uh, uh, ganga yamuna saraswati satluj uh, bias uh, ravi in a sequential manner up to the western tributaries of uh, uh, indus river that is kabul swat everything so where in afghanistan all these rivers are located ganga yamuna to kabul and swat maybe kabul and swat are located there but here it is clearly mentioned in a in an east to west direction right and it is uh, definitely between two major rivers satluj and yamuna i mean if anybody can point out to me in afghanistan there is a river known as yamuna and satluj then i i agree that harakwati saraswati so these are very very pointed and very clear evidences i mean i don't know why we should search I, this river outside india i don't know no no i i think the worry if at all you know i'm just second guessing is the oldness of uh, harappan civilization which can be dated and uh, you know uh, the rigveda and any other uh, uh, details which is not that uh, easily datable given the fact that they are uh, literary uh, sources and the uh, iranian uh, old iranian uh, uh, you know uh, literature as well where again dating is more on a linguistic uh, model so it's it's a question of you know how to connect them and then comes the ideologies to make the whole thing not just a pure uh, academic exercise and take it beyond uh, academics unfortunately it's just my guess uh... again again you see if you look at the literature itself it has many uh, facets of history hidden itself right even in the uh, rigveda Uh, the mandalas they all they don't they don't belong to a single time period right the mandalas mm-hmm. four to six mandalas are earliest uh, one to three uh, they are middle and nine and ten they are they are the last uh, part right so within these uh, the internal chronologies we do find uh, various meanings of the rivers itself and uh, ultimately how the uh, how the uh, ferocious river is slowly dying out i mean even within the rigveda my guru uh, uh, dr bish used to tell how within the rigveda itself you can find evidence uh, towards the end of its uh, uh, compilation you can clearly see the river is slowly uh, dying out right and after 1900 bc i am mean, the saraswati wasn't there i mean if the Sar- if the geologists say after 1900 bc the saraswati was not there or the the present uh, uh, even uh, the or to say the dried up channels which indicate the river saraswati it was not there so where do we place this literature i mean the literature chronology again it was propagated uh, by by some scholars and uh, later on again i i i here mention uh, max muller who initiated this uh, chronology of 1500 bc for rigveda and towards his uh, Uh, end of his lifetime he proposed a uh, thing that it cannot be dated it can be much much or, older right so if you if you look into the geographical references if you look into the internal chronologies if you look into the later period uh, literature so all this is clearly indicate that uh, we cannot have some definite date for rigveda uh, but not definitely 1500 bc it was much much earlier it was it was uh, it belongs to a period when saraswati was flowing i mean that is one chronological marker we need to agree i mean there is no disagreement for that i mean when the rigveda was there saraswati was flowing i mean then and uh, uh, you, uh, then dating saraswati to the uh, evidence the paleo channels etc across the harappan and therefore you are uh, you know you were saying that there is a way to uh, very clearly date uh, rigveda in that sense yeah yeah but again i am i am not telling that rigveda can be dated to one particular time period it, it may it may go even much much earlier because there are different uh, historical facets ses- within the rigveda itself okay so we can we cannot fix it to okay 2000 bc no it can be much much older also because there are many different uh, aspects mentioned in the rigveda so that's what many different scholars also slowly they try to agree even though there is a rigid Uh, another di- diagrammatically opposite view uh, okay. which which also says that okay i mean it is much much later okay so uh, there is a question from uh, mr bharat uh, in fact two questions where he says uh, during mature phase of harappan civilization 
uh, did Harappans have any kind of contact with people from south, from Maharashtrian coast to Malabar coast? Second, there are lots of debates going on now regarding arrival of Harappans to South India after its decline. Is that a valid uh, theory? And do we have any solid archaeological evidence? So, you see, uh, in terms of uh, procurement of raw materials, the Harappans maximum might have come to uh, Narmada, Narmada mm -hmm. River, like Ratanpura, Rajpipla, what I mentioned. I mean, we don't, we don't have at present any evidence to indicate that they, uh, they traded or they, they, they procured raw materials from Maharashtra or the Konkan coast, right? So, beyond that, I mean, question doesn't arise. There is no question of any contact with uh, other parts beyond Maharashtra and Konkan because we don't have even evidence for Maharashtra and Konkan. That's what I meant to say. So regarding Harappan connections with uh, South India, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a huge uh, uh, theory put forth by a certain set of uh, scholars. But as far as I am concerned, there mm -hmm. is no evidence at all because there's a huge time gap between uh, the Harappan uh, culture and the Sangam age, I mean, we don't have uh, we don't have any material evidence to prove that the Harappans migrated or settled down in into the south. I mean, we then then we need to have archaeological evidence in the intermediary regions. I mean, they did not uh, fly over to South India, right? They should have crossed Maharashtra, Karnataka, Southern Karnataka, and ultimately they might have reached the southern part. But we don't have any archaeological site or material culture. To prove this kind of migration, there are distinct cultures in Maharashtra, Kalkolithic culture, which existed even after the demise of the Harappan civilization. The scenario in Karnataka is completely different. They were existing in an agro pastoral lifestyle, which is very beautifully researched upon by scholars like Professor Padaya. And we don't have any indications of any kind of connection, any kind of intrusive elements, even from uh, north or east. I mean, I don't know. I don't understand how they could have reached. Okay. Uh, there is a question from M. V. Baskar. Very interesting question. Right? Indus cities were separated by vast distances. What do we know about roads that connected them? Rivers had to be crossed. Do we know of specific points where they were crossed and how? It's it's very difficult to point out where they crossed. I mean, even with the kind of uh, Historical evidence like how Alexander came and crossed Satluj to wage a war with Porus, we cannot pinpoint at which point he crossed, right? I mean, a lot of uh, geomorphological changes have taken place. Rivers have changed its course. River Indus, which was flowing once uh, to the uh, west of uh, Mohenjadro, it, it's now shifted and it's flowing towards the east of uh, Mohenjadro. It's very difficult. But Road networks did exist. I mean, it's not that uh, road networks did not exist. I mean, in a way, if you if you trace the Grand Trunk Road of uh, Gangetic Plains, its routes can be traced back to the Mauryan period, right? Mm. So these kind of road networks, uh, uh, which could have been uh, very rudimentary in a very early period, might have developed into a, a kind of a highway during later later day period. I mean, even today, uh, if you ask. Uh, uh, people going to pilgrimage, they will always find a shorter route, uh, which was traditional, right? There used to be uh, traditional routes even up to the uh, climbing uh, the Tirumala temple, right? There is a traditional route as well as the modern route. So always the people were knowing the geography when they were communicating with each other and the evidences from the Harappan sites clearly indicate they were using uh, wheeled carriage vehicles. So definitely they were using roads. Definitely. Roads means not in the modern context, but definitely which could be very easily uh, communicated by the carriage vehicles driven by uh, the oxen. Yeah. No, no. Specifically, I think his question comes from there are very well defined cities that we have found through excavation over a very large geographical area. And we don't know what existed between these cities. So it Sort of no, no, no. we have, we have. I understood. I understood actually. I mean, if you take uh, Delhi and uh, Bombay, uh, you don't have a Bombay in between, right? right? You have a Jaipur, you have a Hamdabad. Correct. Similarly, similarly, I mean, I showed the distribution map of the Arapan culture. Mm -hmm. You do have a larger city supported by regional towns, 
okay. smaller towns, villages, hamlets. You do have that hierarchy. Every city had uh, had that hierarchy. Okay. Okay. So in which case, the kind of you know, it doesn't have to be a highway. It could be uh, small roads that are connecting to uh, uh, any Absolutely. of these places. There could be a highway equivalent, and uh, you know, you stayed overnight, you stayed there for a few days, but then eventually from Delhi you do reach Mumbai, and then you ship uh, a lot of items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely the same kind of network was there. That's so. You see, in okay. older times. there were very uh, fewer uh, facilities right they need to have habitations in between so that they can rest uh, in in between so that's why even even for the maritime uh, network we do find settlements at regular intervals we do have on the northern coast of ranaf kach we have junikurans we have lakpat on the karachi coast we have uh, the the balakot we have uh, on the makran coast we have sites so all the all of them they were located at a certain uh, distance uh, so that the people can travel and they can also uh, rest and they can replenish the resources that was always there okay uh, so there are a bunch of questions related to the vehicles right there is a question from tatiana ruzova is what kind of vehicles did the harappans have what kind were the ways of connections with other civilizations i just hold i'll i'll just add uh, two three more uh, questions all related to that and you can uh, take them all together uh, shivram asks do we have any evidence of chariots and horse rearing in the early harappan period uh, and sites rajiv lochan uh, connects this to uh, uh, what one would naturally lead this to could you throw some light on the sinauli chariot some claim it's a war chariot while some claim it was a cart because it did not have spoke wheels and shivram comes back with this question uh, you know again his continuation is especially since the understanding is that uh, chariots came from central asia so how do we resolve the uh, you know the vehicle chariot horses uh, sinauli chariot and what did the harappans do i'll take the chariot question first i mean i showed i showed a slide in which uh, I, i clearly mentioned a single person driven chariot drawn by oxen right that is the direct evidence i mean what else we that's need? a that's a little uh, uh, figurine object. that is yeah, available yeah. object that is I available mean, that that is the object created for playing i mean that directly reflects Absolutely. a contemporary example right right, right. Uh, that is one that one type of a vehicle a chariot a single person like i want to drive individually so i will have my own vehicle okay there are also carriage vehicles in which 10 to 20 people can be i, I showed a hollow framed uh, cart right that right. was their sol- solid frame vehicles were there so they were they were using spoked wheels as well as solid wheels they were using hubbed wheels as well as hubless wheels so okay. different types of um, vehicles from smaller to larger were there and they were also using the bullock carts with the covering okay. i mean they can cover it at the back so th- this this clearly indicates the different types of uh, vehicles you uh, used during the harappans okay. the connection with sanoli sanoli again you see uh, we don't have a evidence of a animal which was driving i mean the contemporary uh, chariot uh, burials from central asia and china they also have a Arts buried along with it. We don't have it here, and uh, the shape of the uh, thing I closely associated with the terracotta model, which I showed in the presentation. Right. It's a single person driven chariot. It's not that Sanoli chariot is unique. It may be. It may be the first uh, evidence of a chariot in a burial. That's it. But you have evidence of a clear terracotta model from a habitation site from Harappa. So. it's not unique i mean you, i'm saying sanoli very unique like it has a coffin burial again it is it is misunderstanding of entire archaeology of harappan culture itself because harappan uh, uh, cemetery it has yielded very beautiful coffin burials mm-hmm. right they have they have got they have even analyzed the wood from there they have the harappans they have used the devdar devdar which come from the himalayan uh, mountains mm-hmm. so all these things they were existing and it is not that sanoli is very unique because sanoli it's a late harappan culture they have all the elements of the harappan culture in a in a degenerated form i mean that that's what i i i understand sanoli okay uh, 
so now uh, let's come to uh, the lingering problem of understanding the writing right you mentioned that uh, the uh, you know from based on seals that we have and symbols that we have one symbol could mean a word or uh, you know an alphabet right now uh, how uh, are you projecting that that's for my first question my question uh, and you also mentioned that there is no bi or trilingual inscription which is which is sadly uh, the problem uh, which is really affecting us in a big way that we cannot figure out what they were saying but for me the even bigger issue is that a culture that developed uh, such sophisticated uh, you know cities and artifacts etc when we compare it with something like uh, the mesopotamian you know uh, and the egyptian civilization where one major thing is the volume of writing whatever the material they used it could be uh, papyrus it could be clay tablet we don't see that volume forget about the fact that we are unable to interpret as a different matter how could they have managed something without large volume writing if large volume writing existed then we should be somehow able to find out so there's a conundrum there uh, is it not i don't see any conundrum because i would ask wh- where is the evidence of such uh, volume of recordings during the sangam age they were trading with the romans where where is where is, where is the evidence we don't have but there's a much later uh, period uh... that's what i am telling even for the much later period we don't have evidence and we are talking about at least 2000 years before the sangam age i will come to the question i mean why you don't find the volume of written records we cannot compare harappan culture with mesopotamian or the egyptian because there the writing emerged much much earlier in the mesopotamian it starts in the neolithic phase that is 8000 bc mm-hmm. right and they were recording each and every object traded upon right and right. slowly they 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 clearly uh, they they uh, um, approach the writing stage that is the alphabetic stage and uh, that that went on to a clear transformation we don't have that kind of we do, we do have rudimentary writing during the early harappan times mm-hmm. but this writing of the harappan times it was not meant for recording any trade any items traded i showed you examples at least three examples from the mesopotamian context and one from the uh, oman context right. and it is the ownership record you see i am sending a, a bundle of goods to mesopotamia to my agent i also told you that uh, the harappans were living in the Har- mesopotamian cities and three or four generations later they they forgot about their uh, antecedents and they were communicating with the local script okay. right so my agent is in over imagine that my agent is in over and i am from dolavira mm. i am sending a huge uh, the, a con- uh, what is a uh, bundle of goods Right. right in a cer- ceramic vessel and i'm feeling that i'm putting my mark mm-hmm. okay so that my agent can understand okay what is written is written there so when it reaches the final destination my agent w- alone can open that no other person can open that because of the identification okay who is who is sending the material so that is the purpose beyond that it is not recording any historically even it is not dis- uh, uh, recording any even items that is being sent no so this is how the limited purpose of a harappan seal so when they were not at all uh, concerned about any other additional information there was no necessity for recording any such things that's why the volume is very less volume is only meant for trade volume uh, is only meant to record the ownership record that's it nothing mm. beyond it so that's why i don't see uh, i am not surprised uh, because the nature of the harappan culture is itself is different and so that's why we see this kind of uh, very uh, fewer number of uh, writing uh, what is a numerals also not numerals the writing signs uh, and they they were in a stage known as the logo syllabic logo syllabic i mean the the uh, scholars working on the evolution of script they clearly understand that uh, the script start from pictographic then ideographic then logographic then syllabic mm-hmm. then alphabetic 
so here the harappan sign is somewhere between logographic and syllabic so that's why it is known as logo syllabic so that what does it mean is that the next stage after logographic is the syllabic there is a drastic reduction of number of signs mm. from around 400 signs it reduces to 120 signs okay. imagine one fourth nearly one fourth that was due to the phonetization of the sign okay so before syllabic there was no phonetization so if you don't have phonetization you have to have unique symbol for each and every object or an idea right mm. so that's why the number of uh, signs are more but once you have reached the stage of phonetization then you will have only one sign for one phonetic value then you remove all the other signs there is no necessity and the syllabic is the most recent stage where you will have a, another drastic reduction of number of signs so that's why scholars i mean i am i am not an expert in that arapan uh, script but scholars who are working on that they identify it as a logo syllabic and they say that one sign can either mean a complete word or a single phonetic value because it is a logo syllabic it, it is approaching the syllabic form of writing it they have not achieved that so that's why there is a possibility okay and the lesser number of signs it is a clear indication that it is not a uh, what is a syllabic or a phonetic uh, alphabetic form of writing okay then you need for writing a word you may have you may require three or four signs right, right. so right. writing a complete sentence you may have more number of signs so the, the number of signs in an inscription will increase but here the number of signs in an inscription maximum is i think 16 or 17 that's it beyond that we don't have mm. this is a clear indication that about its nature okay uh journalist ts subramanya he uh, has a question can we ever unravel the mystery behind making the stoneware bangles and ernestite drill bits stoneware bangle as i told you uh, i mean uh, professor mark kanover is an excellent uh, experimental archaeologist he has uh, he has produced many different objects of the harappan times so mm-hmm. he attempted once for producing the stoneware bangles but he could not achieve the final that uh, very very illustrious uh, surface otherwise uh, the technology is understood because uh, from mohanjodaro the the complete arrangement is found how they were heating inside a two uh, ceramic vessel arrangement that is known but how they were actually controlling the temperature how they were actually heating the bangles in a reducing and an oxidizing environment that is mm-hmm. very difficult to understand because these bangles are found in two different colors one is uh, from are what is that <laughs> from uh, some gray gray to black and the another is uh, reddish orange uh, uh, color so that is that is the evidence for uh, reducing and oxidizing conditions okay. so that 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 particular point might not have been well understood but ultimately we do know the chemical composition how it is manufactured in harappa how it is different from mohenjodaro what are the shapes what are the different uh, phases what is the chemical composition all those things we know but the exact replica it is very difficult to master that maybe maybe one is engaged for uh, uh, many different years one can do that so that is very difficult regarding ernest i told you that we don't uh, have uh, the evidence of its provenance we don't know where it came from uh, it is not in the geological uh, mineral list also so it, it that's why scholars tend to feel that it could have been uh, manufactured by the harappans by heating certain stones they could have attained this but it it is still in a research uh, arena only we are still researching on that uh, we are still trying to locate its uh, source but the but the thing is that it is it is exclusive to gujarat the number of ernestite drill bits found in the gujarat sites it's a clear indication that it is uh, definitely the provenance is in gujarat alone it's not in sindh it's not in um, punjab it is only in so gujarat it's, it's more a regional uh, specialty then uh, they yeah, that, uh, that's why that's why the gujarat harappans they exemplified 
in this uh, bead manufacturing because the raw material is local the ernestite is local, local and the using ernestite was very important because they could perforate in a much limited time when compared to other stones so ultimately somewhere uh, they have hidden the ernestite resource from us <laughs> we need to try more and find out okay uh, there's a question from uh, saravana kumar uh, and i will extend it further so he his question is any possibilities of unearthing more indices which may throw light on the language understanding but if i can sort of proceed further are we looking at uh, you know we, we have been adding more sites in the recent times i mean from the time 100 years now uh, have we so far found dramatically different seals from where we started with and therefore uh you know does it even make sense that if you if you excavated few more places that you will even get uh, considerably different seals from what our entire corpus so far is we may or we may not i mean that's why i mentioned in my talk uh, that the ultimate answer lies in mesopotamia uh like posel uh, he he proposed this much much uh, earlier 30 years back even he when he wrote this famous article on meluha he told that where we need to search for a bilingual inscription is in mesopotamia because the harappans were living there they were communicating they were, were trading with the mesopotamians we don't see a, a what is a, a reverse uh, settlement here we don't have evidence of uh, mesopotamians living, living in the uh, harappan city so that's why you see the more evidence i i showed you also to uh, uh, uniform tablets mentioning clearly the harappan settling there and there is a mention of meluha village right. so if all these things are there naturally we should i mean there is a very famous uh, meluhan interpreter seal also so if all these evidences are there clearly indicating the presence of harappans in mesopotamia we should collaborate maybe with iraq syria may should we should uh, initiate special uh, decipherment programs of the cuneiform tablets uh, i think majority of them are still lying undeciphered there are thousands and thousands of terracotta tablets mm. Uh, mm. from each city so we need to do that we need to do that extra step and uh, try to convince uh, these countries and uh, maybe set up special uh, funds for deciphering these and ultimately we may find a solution it's not that uh, uh it's it's impossible it is clearly possible and that is where the solution lies actually so and you, you were also uh, interpreting it as maximum that the harappans would have gone to is the uh, mesopotamian region and if the material has been found beyond that it is not direct but probably to indirect sources so yeah yeah point to sort of that uh, sorry yeah for that i'll i'll quote one evidence there is a there is a hoard of jewelry coming from a site known as mari mari mm. in uh, southern syria on the euphrates uh, river so there is uh, a set of jewelry okay uh, it includes lapis lazuli cornelian a typical harappan uh, the long barrel beads okay and uh, some very beautiful jewelry so one of one of the beads it has an inscription very beautiful mm. inscription in cuneiform it says that it was a gift from a, from the king of ur Okay, right. Mesen Pada. Mesen Pada was the ruler of Ur. He is donating this to the ruler of uh, Mari. That is 500, 400, 500 kilometers north of uh, Ur. Okay. Right? So that is one clear indication. I mean, the the treasures reaching the Harappan material. So yeah, Harappan. We are we are we are clearly seeing a Mesopotamian ruler getting hold of a Harappan material, giving it to uh, a yeah, Syrian region. modern syrian region yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. rule uh, possibly a ruler let's say yeah yeah, yeah. fantastic okay so that's how it it might have been traded actually i mean we do have evidence i mean there is uh, this article of posel it, it do points out uh, the presence of even uh, the kutch region uh, ceramics up to the southern borders of turkey but mm. all these things need further investigation i mean if the ceramics are there then ceramics they may not have been traded or that particular ceramics might have been traded so what we know at the present state of knowledge is that uh, these jewelry they might have been traded with the southern cities of mesopotamia because mm-hmm. the inscription clearly indicate that uh, 
we don't have any inscriptions from northern mesopotamia indicating a trade with the harappans so all these things put together uh, what i feel is because greek greek and all uh, uh, one or two harappan beads reaching there it may not may not have been direct trade and jewelry this kind of jewelry it can be retained for a very long period i mean we know the tradition of uh, jewelry being passed down from generation to generation so that could have been uh, passed down from generation to generation and even it might it might be found even 400 500 years later also that that was uh, that is also possible okay uh, so one uh, final question uh, we you know we see from the mesopotamian records uh, names like dilmun meluha and magan right uh, any other contemporary see uh, you also showed with your very first diagram that egyptians were there they had a civilization they had writing chinese had certainly enough uh, writing by that time sir any other writing that sort of hints towards the indian settlements their names their culture or anything else of that period we are talking 5000 6000 7000 8000 years no we don't have, we don't have any other evidence i mean apart from the mesopotamian records we don't have any other um, written evidence of that particular time period mentioning these regions mesopotamians of course they they mention many different regions even egyptian right. and the other cultures okay so in that sense uh, mesopotamian uh, material is very unique in that uh, we have to go through their uh, writings very thoroughly try to get it uh, interpreted translated uh, and become sort of uh, a record of the world around that time because that's the only uh, thing that covers multiple uh, uh, civilizations in some sense definitely i mean i i would uh, even dream an indian team excavating in mesopotamia i mean i don't know i mean when that will happen <laughs> if and if uh, even the- geopolitical uh, yeah if an india team can, etc yeah because we we do have lot of uh, connections i mean we have connections with the east, eastern part of iran the sistan region mm. we are we are closely connected with the central asian region and we are connected with oman bahrain but no indian team works in these countries right i mean we do find all other scholars internationally acclaimed scholars mm. they work in this region but not an indian one indian team so that is a very big drawback i mean maybe we should have a, a, a national a national initiative of deputing some senior archaeologists maybe from archaeological survey of india mm. so that they can take up a project that may not last for i mean that may last for decades i mean it cannot be achievable in one or two years i mean i know professor tosi working in oman since 1960s professor tosi dr sergi kluzo i mean they did commendable work they are the people who brought out uh, all the evidences of this uh, in the indian and uh, arapan and this oman connection so they worked for nearly 30 years 30 years continuously but unfortunately in india we don't work i mean we we work work in a site for 3 or 4 years that's it i mean we are satisfied we move to a mother site so that's a that's a real drawback i mean i i really dream i mean really dream a future indian archaeology team working in these areas and uh, try to pull out a harappan jar from from mesopotamian <laughs> site <laughs> so that will be uh, a discovery of that century uh, and uh, some magical uh, bilingual uh, tablet uh, no it will come there i mean it will be there in mesopotamia it will uh, be there okay there will there will be some sort of a treaty some sort of a, if there is a inscription mentioning a meluhan interpreter right that should be some treaty some kind of arrangement between uh, and it might be lying in one of the archives of our kish nippur who knows i mean it may be still lying there <laughs> okay wonderful uh, thank you i know i would uh, like to end this uh, uh, you know session with this uh, positive note and uh, opening up exciting possibilities for future researchers that uh, you know probably like just like how we have learned so much about india from the roman and greek records likewise i think most likely 
it's the mesopotamian uh, records that's probably going to tell us a lot about the harappan uh, civilization and uh, your uh, uh, you know uh, wish that there is a large number of indian researchers from asi and from various universities collaborating with various other researchers in the uh, that region and from around the world to uh, go more into this uh, we hope that happens in the coming decades thank you thank you for a wonderful lecture with about 100 years of uh, work in this area by uh, various scholars uh, it has given us a fairly good insight i mean i know the uh, we didn't even talk a lot about the artifacts that we have found uh, interpretation of that etc except a little bit of beads uh, we have not talked about bricks we have not talked about measures and the uh, you know uh, a nice uh, uh, geometric progression there's so much to talk about but uh, i guess uh, uh, you know this is this is a very very interesting uh, area and uh, we in uh, Uh, Tamil Heritage Trust. We have been. We are planning for uh, a much bigger event. So we'll certainly come to you uh, with some ideas on uh, how we can organize that. Uh, we we really want to understand more about uh, the Harappan civilization to its fullest to the extent that uh, scholars have already uh, interpreted and understood it. So thank you, thank you for your uh, wonderful lecture, and uh, we hope we can learn more uh, from you and thank various you. other scholars of uh, this particular field. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a, an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, all the viewers, and we will meet again uh, next month, uh, uh, first Saturday, with another lecture. Thank you.